Take two. Okay, today we're going to talk about spectral analysis. Um, and there are two different areas I want to talk about. So let's say two types. The first type will be um, signals which are well, we'll talk about not random, but you could have random signals, um, but they will be not stationary. So this won't mean anything to you at the moment, but I'll explain. So let's say not random, but also not stationary. And that doesn't mean anything to many of you. Stationary. I'll explain shortly. Um, and the second type will be probably more useful. Um, particularly for biological signal processing where we get signals on the surface of the skin, for example, say EMG, which is quite a random looking signal. Um, it's a superposition of many a uh, action potentials firing at, at, uh, uh, with a very complex timing, so it looks random. So random, uh, or stochastic, and stationary. Stationary. So I've used this word stationary twice, and what do I mean by it? Uh, I'm not going to, we could spend a whole lecture talking about stationarity. Um, it, it's a property of random signals, uh, stochastic signals, um, but I'll just give you a sense of it. Stationarity. So a kind of crude definition would be that the... Um, Probability distribution um, over time does not change. Um, and that's a very superficial way of explaining it to you. But what I want to say is that if there was, if it's, if the, the signal is um, described by a random process, so maybe it's a, a sample that we take from a Gaussian distribution, we say let's, it's a random signal, let's go and draw a sample from a Gaussian distribution and plot that again at this point in time, and then perhaps I go for the next um, time point and I draw, go back to my distribution and I draw another sample and place that down. So that is just me plotting, um, drawing samples from a random distribution and plotting them against time. And to say that it's stationary in this case would mean maybe the Gaussian from which I draw the samples, its mean doesn't change over time and its standard deviation doesn't change over time. So the signal is altogether unpredictable. It's completely random, but its underlying properties of the distribution from which it comes is not changing with time. That is stationary. So stationary means fixed, not moving. Um, so that's really in a sense what we're trying to say. So the signal, if I saw this signal, um, say it looked like an EMG signal, I want to describe it by uh, samples drawn from a Gaussian distribution, I would look at the mean of it and I would say I hope that mean doesn't change with time and I would look at the power, the spread of the signal and I would say if it was stationary that power wouldn't change in time. So if you were to see a signal where its, its amplitude is being modulated in some way, um, you would probably guess that it wasn't stationary. So we'll talk about those types of signals as well. So that's, it's very superficial. We could go deep into the mathematics of what it means to be stationary. And there's a, a very simplified version of stationary, which is called wide sense stationary, which means not the full probability distribution, but simply the mean doesn't change with time and the covariance matrix doesn't change. So it's standard deviation and the relationship between it. There was multiple channels that the, the correlations between those will be stationary over time. And that's what you'll see in a lot of textbooks, what's called wide sense stationary. So all you need to think about is that it, that there, it is a random signal, but its underlying properties are not changing with time. And we might be able to estimate those if we can average um, parts of the signal over time. Um, so what am I saying here? It's unpredictable. But its statistics are fixed. So that's the kind of random signals that we're going to deal with. Okay, so let's talk about the, 
the lecture is split into two halves and then I guess maybe two and a half parts. Uh, the first part we'll talk about dealing with signals which are not random, although they could be random, we won't talk about that today, but they're not stationary. What kind of analysis could we apply to signals where the property, the, the property of the signal changes with time? And then we'll, the second part we'll talk about random signals and how to get the spectrum of a random signal. Uh, and then there's a little bit at the end where we'll talk about the relationship between, once again, it pops up all over the place. We talked about it for discrete Fourier transform, we talked about it for filtering, and we'll talk about it again, the relationship between the window shape, the window length, and the behavior in the frequency domain. So that's just to finish the lecture off, because these are design choices that will be important. So first up, we, there are many different types of analyses. One, that we'll talk about is the short time Fourier transform. Um, which we'll let's call it the STFT short time Fourier transform. So if the signal properties are changing with time, and so it's not stationary, what is the spectrum? Or how do we visualize the spectrum? So you have to disentangle. People think, they think about um, what he, he says that the signal is changing with time. Of course the signal is changing with time. The signal wouldn't be a signal. It wouldn't be a very interesting signal if it wasn't changing with time. The most interesting signal is a signal that does not change with time. It's a DC signal. It just is flat across of all, all time. That is not what I mean by stationary. The signal can change with time. That's fine. A sinusoid, for example, it changes with time. It goes up and down over time. But its properties do not change with time. It has a frequency and it has an amplitude, and they are fixed for all time. So that's what I mean by stationary. The underlying properties of the signal are stationary. And in this case here, I'm going to show you an example with a sinusoid which changes its properties over time. So it might go from a high frequency to a low frequency. So let's draw that picture. An example. So we may have a signal x of t, and perhaps it's at one frequency for a little while. Um, it does this. And then after a time, it switches and it goes to um, a different frequency, a lower frequency. And I can see that at this time, this is where the, the change happens. I switch the frequency at, at this time here, and we can just write down what the frequencies will be before and after. So the interval here, the period from here to here, let's call that T1. And the period of this sinusoid is T2. So if I said to you, can you help me to visualize the spectrum of the signal? Um, what, what approach would you take? And a naive approach, it's not unreasonable. In fact, it's, what, it's pretty much what we'll come back to do for spectral analysis of random signals. Um, it's just to take a Fourier transform of the whole sequence. And if we did that, um, the result would be, so let's say, take a Fourier transform. I will get, where do I draw it, it doesn't matter, and this one's twice, so at 1 over T1, uh, sorry, T, T2 T is the lower, is the time, or the period of the lower frequency signal, so that one will happen here, so this will be 1 over T2, and this one will be 1 over T1. And what I expect to see, well, if I had 
for infinity in that direction, I'd almost get a delta function and infinity in that direction, but maybe I don't. Maybe I only have a window which goes from here to here, and if I did the spectrum, remember you get this windowing effect where you get convolution of the window um, in the frequency domain. Because it's multiplying a rectangular window to cut out this section, we multiply in the time domain, we get convolution in the frequency domain. So what would have been delta functions get convolved with the uh, Fourier transform of the window, which is a kind of sink shape. So we'll end up getting something that it'll have some little ripples out here, and then it will come up like this. We'll have some ripples, and then again here, we'll have some ripples. I probably should draw them the same amplitude. And that's fine. So this would be the magnitude, perhaps, of a Fourier transform. We're just purely in the time, in the, in the continuous time domain here. We haven't talked about this uh, digital signal processing at all, so no, no sampling yet. That's fine, and it does represent a lot of information about the signal. We can now see that there, there is a component at a frequency 1 over T2, and there is a component at 1 over T1. But what I've lost, there is some more information in the signal which is, which is not captured, which is this time evolution. When did that switch happen? So how would I do a better job? If I, I've lost some information. I don't know. It's not, it's not clear to me by looking at this picture whether, whether this happened first or that happened first, or whether they switched back and forward along the way. That information is lost. So I guess we're going to jump to the end. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we want to calculate, which captures more of the information, and then I'll tell you how to do it. So really, the vision is to have a, a plot which looks like this. We're going into three dimensions now. Maybe time runs this way. And if I could draw straight, frequency would run that way. And this is my amplitude axis. So this is a three-dimensional plot. One, one axis, the other axis, and this is the result of the transform in the z direction. And let's go back a second. Let's call this time uh, t0, the time when the switch happens. So maybe this is a t0. And this is the frequency 1 over T2, so let's call it F2. And this being the frequency F1 equal to 1 over T1. So now what does the, the plot look like? What would I like to see? There are two ways to come at this. Um, and I'll actually show you, we'll, we'll do a, um, a derivation of the short time Fourier transform, like a really sort of detailed um, derivation of, how, of its behavior. And we'll see that one way will be, you could quit it this way. So we could figure, pick a frequency, and we could filter the signal in such a way that only that frequency gets through. And then what we would get is a signal that would come out, and we could plot that signal a long time like this. So we would get pretty much zero here. And for this one here, which is um, the lower frequency, that happens later. Um, out of the filter bank, we would get zero going along this way, and then it would pop up and it would start to ripple like this. That, that's one way to draw a signal. So a filter bank against time where the frequency split out this way. A different way, which is what the short time Fourier transform does, is it says, let's stop at each time point and take a, a, an estimate of the spectrum in a small region of time. So it says, stop here, what's the spectrum? Stop here, what's the spectrum? And all the way along. So just keep that in your mind. There's two different ways to approach it. One is a filter bank, bank approach, which gives you a time domain result. So you, you end up with signals spitting out of the filter bank, running a long time, side by side with each other. And the other is um, a, a, a spectrum or a, a, um, a transform approach where you stop at each time point, take a small region of the signal, and you take a transform of that and see what it looks like. So that's, that's the first one we'll deal with. So the vision is that it should, I would hope it will look like this. Um, the higher frequency happened first, so we had some component um, like that. So that might be, if I go back a page, that may be me looking at the signal just in here and saying, what's the frequency, what's the spectrum of that signal? 
and I get some higher frequency component and pretty much nothing else. The window is very narrow, um, so in the frequency domain, that's, that sync function will be actually a lot wider than this. It will be very broad. And then I'm going to move along to the next time step. So the next time step is here, and I should actually get the same frequency again. And the same. So this will continue until I get to T0. Um, you get the idea, okay? So at every point in time, I get an estimate of, of the spectrum. This is going to be a little bit fat, actually, because the time window is very narrow, just to, to isolate that region in time. And now a switch is going to happen. So there's going to be a funny um, overlap where I get a little bit of both of them here. And then it will all switch to this frequency. Um, and that is the short time Fourier transform. So here I'm plotting the magnitude of the spectrum that I take at each time point, and I'm, I'm only looking at a small section of the signal. So mathematically, how do I achieve that? Um, let's deal with continuous first. Continuous time. So we can see now it's a, a function of, of two different variables. I'll, leave, I'll fix the time variable and leave the frequency variable open for the moment. So I'm going to pick a specific time, T0, that I want to evaluate and then have some omega, which is a variable for the moment, which I could also fix. And that will be, and really this, you would almost guess the solution by now. Um, this is a Fourier transform and the 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 only innovation here is that rather than taking the transform of the signal x of t, which, might have, which was on the previous page, I now have a window function that I'm going to use to isolate a part of the signal that I care about. And the window function, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about it shortly, but it is going to be shifted out to the time that I care about. So I care about what's happening in the signal at time t0 sub 0 at the moment. So I'm going to make sure that window is centered on the signal at time t0. And the window is going to have a certain shape, which is that it's, it's peaked around the time I care about and it falls away to 0 in other places. Um, so let's draw a picture of that. So this is the window function. And it's uh, centered. I can't even write today. Centered at t equal t zero. All right, let's do an example, an illustration. So this is what's called a chirp function. Um, and this is relevant to the lab today. Uh, I'm going to draw a chirp, which is a sinusoid that's frequency increases. So it, its underlying characteristics are changing with time. It's not stationary. Its frequency increases with time. Um, so it goes from, a, imagine a pure sound that rises in its pitch. You get <whistles> That's the kind of sound you want to get. In the lab today, I've got uh, a file, which is a recording of, of a bat hunting. And it's actually the opposite. They sweep down, so they go and they do it at very high frequencies. You can't hear it, and I assume the prey can't hear it, but they do echolocation with this, with this sweeping sound and are able to localize with their eyes closed and using sonar, their eyes closed, they're using their ears and the sound to figure out where the, the prey is. And so this is, this is relevant to what we're going to do in the lab today. 
Uh, the, to write an equation for this, it will be x of t is equal to the sine of... Now, the frequency is time-dependent. So let's say it's at a fixed fre frequency omega 0, omega naught. But that's a linear function of time. So this is the effective frequency here. So it's omega t squared, but if you think about that, that's omega times t. So this is the frequency changing with time, linearly with time. And then, obviously, we need omega t inside uh, the sine. Let's draw a picture. And this is always hard to draw because, um, well, you know. So this is sine of omega naught t squared. The sine starts at 0 for t equal to 0, and then it's going to grow, so let's put some guidelines in. It's going to grow in its, amplitude, in its frequency over time. The amplitude will be fixed at 1, minus 1. And so it will start very slowly, and it will ramp up, and then the frequency will increase. And then by some stage it will be, you get the idea, the frequency gets very, very high. It's an awful drawing. Let me just redraw that because I want to spread it over time a bit more. Yeah. And so on. Da, da, da. try and squeeze this all in here. Now I'd like to estimate the spectrum at different points in time and I can see that the property of the signal is changing so I need to pick a window with that I want to, you know, re time resolution. How, over what range of time do I want to see what's happening in the signal? And we'll see that that, that width that we decide will be important later. Um, arbitrarily I'll just say let's, let's care about this point in time. Let's call that T0. And let's center a window here. Um, some window that goes like this, and this is g of t minus t0. And you can see what's coming next because I wrote the equations previously. Um, we'll multiply them together so we'll get g of t minus t0 multiplied by x of t. And it's pretty much going to be, well, let's put the envelope in of this guy. And what's that signal do underneath there? So it goes up this way, and then it comes down here. And it crosses 0 at this point. And it goes negative, And then it does, the frequency increases, and then so on. All right, so, so now we have something which um, is more useful in the sense that we've isolated the part in time, the region in time that we care about, and now we can take a transform of this and see what it looks like. So I'm going to jump to the next page. So now, take the Fourier transform of this. Now we're still in continuous time. Uh, we haven't gone to discrete, so samples or discrete time. We'll do that shortly. So let's take the Fourier transform of this, and we'll get a plot similar to what I showed you. Time running this way. Frequency running that way. Let's do it in, in omega rather than hertz, radians per second. And this is my short time Fourier transform, which is a function of t and f omega. And what I expect to see is that the frequency rises with time. Um, hopefully you can visualize that. That's a, a guideline I'm drawing in the, in the omega t plane. Um, and I'll see that very low frequency. Um, let's pick this as my, um, this is t0, and this is, Yeah. 
let's go back. So what I want to show you here is at t0, I could, you could guesstimate, guesstimate, that's a word, you could estimate what is the frequency at this point in time very crudely. I mean, you wouldn't get it perfectly right, but you wouldn't be too far off either. So you might say, look, it looks like a kind of a sinusoid that's changing its frequency, and I've isolated out this part. What is, say, half the period? I could probably do that well. So say from here to here, from the last trough to the next peak, that might give me about half the period of the sinusoid. So if I said that this from here, oh, should I? if I said from here to here is about um, some period t over 2, um, you could estimate the frequency, so the frequency is around about, um, so this, let's call it f0, uh, is, a, is about 1 over t. So that's a guess, a rough guess. And, and the reason I, draw, I, I want to tell you about this frequency is just so I can draw on the picture on the next slide where this is. So this, this is about my f0 here, roughly equal to 1 over um, that t value that we've shown. The point is that these should intersect here at this point. So if I took the transform of what was on the last slide, I'll get something that looks like this. It will spike here at this point, and it will go down like that. All right, so that's for that particular uh, position in time where I said t equal to t0, and I put the window over the time domain waveform, and I took a Fourier transform of it, and I got something that looked like this. And that all makes sense to me. I see that, um, yep, it spikes up at a frequency which is roughly equal to 1 over t, and that's what I would have guessed from the previous thing, just by eyeballing it. And if I did that, if I then rather slid this across in times, let's do it here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and every time I slide it to a different time point, I, do I got through this process, I will build up a picture, and I can complete this three-dimensional plot. So I should get, you know, if I started with a very small shift in time, I'll get something like that, and then the next one will be here like this, and so on. So this next part now is a little bit dense. It's the most, once we're finished that, really the rest of the lecture is quite descriptive. So me drawing pictures and describing um, the results of, of properties that you know already. Um, this, this, this next part is a little bit, a little bit tough down. What I want to show you, we're going to move into, time, into the, the sam uh, so discrete time now. And we're going to take samples of the signal. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that the short time period transform behaves exactly like a filter bank. Now, we don't implement it as a filter bank. If you want to implement it, this is the way that you do it. You shift to a time, you window, and you take a Fourier transform. But to try to understand the behavior of it, it actually behaves exactly like a filter bank. And we can understand the properties of the filter bank, which are related to the window size and shape and so on, at the end of this result. So yeah, it's not an apology. It's just a warning that this bit is a little bit tough. But it's, yeah. Just a lot of algebra, but nothing that you can't do. So let's look at this uh, discrete time. So discrete short time for a transform. Oops. So rather than t naught, now this will be. I'll be interested in what's happening at some sample index n naught. So I have samples of a signal, and I stop at the sample equal n equal to n naught, and I want to see what the spectrum looks like at that particular point in time. And so unsurprisingly, this is simply a discrete Fourier transform. So we sum from n to minus infinity to infinity, except now our samples, this g of n, is shifted to sample index n naught, and I multiply by, I'm going to change this to say x of n, e to the minus j omega n t, just fit it in. So remember, don't be bamboozled, this is just a waveform. It happens to be uh, the full waveform multiplied by a window which isolates a region of time. 
that window is centered at sample index n0, and it's likely symmetric. Um, so it's sort of Gaussian shape or a Hamming window or something like that. And the rest is a discrete time Fourier transform that we've seen many times before, sum over all n, not just n samples, um, and e to the j omega nt. Now, what about this window? If the window has, let's say, n equal to q plus 1 samples, and let's also say that q is even, the reason I want it to be even so I can divide it by 2. So what am I saying? We had some waveform, that was my x of n. And I'm going to center upon this waveform some window function. This is my g of n minus n naught, centered at time n naught, with n running this way. And what I'm saying to you is that this window function g only has a width of n samples across here, and it's equal to q plus 1, and q is even. So I get q over 2 on this side, I get one sample bang in the center, and I get q over 2 on the other side. So imagine if q were, were um, 10, for example, that's an even number. I would have 11 samples, so q plus 1 is 11. I have one sample in the center, I have five samples on this side, and five samples on that side. So that's the width of the window. q plus 1 samples, symmetric, and, you know, in the, uh, yeah, you get it. So now I could write... And this is just a bunch of algebra now, so it's a little bit tedious, but let's go through it. And the short time for a transform will now be at n naught and omega. The summation will go n equal to n0 minus q over 2, all the way up to n0 plus q over 2. And the rest is the same. N naught x of n e to the minus j omega n t. So all that's happened now, we had an infinite sum, but I'm telling you that the window doesn't have any value anywhere else except for in those q plus 1 samples for which it takes some, some value. So it's 0 outside here, 0 outside there, and just has q plus 1 non-zero values across that summation. So this summation is not infinite anymore. It's over q plus 1 terms. And now we have the nice, the reason that q is even, because I can divide it by 2 and get an integer. So I can come from this end, pass through the, the center term, and go up to the top end. So just summing across um, the window multiplied by the signal. And because the window is symmetric, I can say, that g of n minus, if I write slower it comes out better, n minus n naught is equal to g of n naught minus n. And you will have to think about that for a second, why is that the case? So imagine I had some n naught at center at some sample that I care about, maybe it's, it's 17, and then when n becomes 20, what do I get? I get 20 minus 17, which is going to be 3. Over here, I would have 17 minus 20, so I get minus 3. So whatever the argument of this is, this is the negative of it, and because the window g of n, if I were to draw it, it is symmetric around 0, I get the same answer. For, I, I'm just going either positive, positive n or negative n. So I get that. And that's useful because I can do some variable transformations then. Um, so let's write down the next line. Short time for a transform n naught omega. See what's changed. Yes, okay. That's why we do it. So the only thing that changes this time, the sum still goes from n naught minus q over 2 
for 2n0 plus q over 2. That's unchanged. The only thing that's changed here is that this now becomes n0 minus n x of n e to the minus j omega n t. Oop, big t. t. Sample interval. So what have we done? We've done two tricks so far. One is that we've made the sum finite because the window only has q plus 1 samples. The second trick is because the window is symmetric, we can do a change of, of the summation variable um, n in here. That's two tricks. We have one more trick to go, which is a, a change of variable. So here what we will do is we will say that k equals n naught minus n. Now the reason I'm doing this, just, just to give you some, some foresight about where I'm trying to get to, this is starting to look like a filter. So remember the difference equation for a filter where you had the summation of the signal that's coming in. So this would be our signal x of n. And it gets multiplied by a bunch of filter taps. So it's like h of 0, x of n minus 0, h of 1, x of n minus 1, plus h of 2, x of n minus 2. Uh, it's a difference equation. This is starting to look like a difference equation. So I have this term being the signal, and this is starting to look like the coefficient of a filter. So maybe this needs to have a k in here, because the summation normally goes over k. So I'm going to change this to be a k, and then see what happens. So I've got to change all the variables now. So instead of n minus n not minus n, I'm going to write k. I'm going to change all the summation variables and everything to match up with that, and then I'm going to see what I'm left with. So one thing that we'll have to change is when, if k is going to be n minus n naught, that means that n is going to be equal to n naught minus k. So everywhere I see an n, I've got to write n naught minus k, which means in here, this n becomes n naught minus k. So I'm going to have n naught what am I going to get? N from N naught to this one. I'm going to have to change that to be N naught minus K. And then you figure out what the K value is. So you do a change of the summation variables. They actually swap around. So this one's going to end up on the bottom, and this one's going to end up on the top. Um, so you will get now the summation short time for a transform. And now it's going to be summing over k equal to minus q naught up to q, sorry, minus q over 2 up to q over 2. So what happens is this limit here, the bottom limit in the, the summation, becomes the top limit here. And this limit, which is the top limit in this summation, becomes the bottom limit here after you change the variable. So it's a, it's a s sneaky little trick. And that gives us a, a g of k in here. Um, yeah, x of, and now, and this becomes n naught minus k. Now this is really starting to look like a filter um, equation, because we're going back to the, the, the values of the signal, and we're multiplying them by the taps of the, the filter. But the problem is, oh, it's not a problem, um, well, it is that I can't fit it on the page. e to the minus j omega n not minus k t. I have this sort of irritating term on the end here. So let's just do one more rearrangement. So this will still be a sum from k equal to minus q over 2, up to q over 2. Uh, g of k, I'm just going to split the exponential up. Ah, you. Um, e to the j omega kt. So that's all the k stuff on one part. I hate this pen. kt e to the minus j omega 
and not t by x of n not minus k. And all of this stuff here let's call this h of k on the next on the next slide. So now I have the signal of my point in time n naught that I care about. I'm trying to evaluate. And then I seem to be going backwards through the sample, so going backwards in time and multiplying it by some coefficient. And then I sum over those coefficients. This is a filtering equation, a difference equation. So the question now becomes, what if, this were, if these are the coefficients of a filter, what kind of filter is it? And I, well, I told you the answer a couple of minutes ago. Um, well, let's have a look at it again. So we get that our filter coefficients, h of k, are equal to, let's just rearrange a little bit, e to the minus j n naught omega t by g of k by e to the minus j omega k t. It's still a bit, a little bit scary. Um, so I s imagine I said to you, let, let's have a look at um, a particular frequency. So let's just do omega equal to omega naught. So I'll have h of k equal to e to the minus j n naught omega naught t g of k e to the minus j omega not kt. Pardon? You, uh, you're probably right. Let me just go back a second. Yeah, I've got positive k. You're right. Yeah, let me just, uh, before I jump and make the change, let me just double, double, double check. And over to... Yeah, you're right. This is positive, isn't it? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. It's funny how these mistakes, when you make a little mistake like that, somehow it persists for a couple of years before somebody picks it up. And then you, but you're so hesitant to change it because you're like, how did it survive for three years and nobody picked it up? So it's. Is it in the notes? Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. So we've got, um, you picked it up and he's confirmed it. And I think you're both right, so let's go with that. Um, good. It, does, it doesn't change things too much. It just makes it a little bit harder to see what's happening. Um, okay, so here's where we're at. This is now a constant. It's a complex number, but it's, um, there's nothing... Everything's fixed. That's the sample interval, a couple of milliseconds. Depends on what rate we're sampling. Maybe we're sampling in the kilohertz, so it's down in the milliseconds. This is some frequency that I'm, one, I'm curious. What is the behavior of this filter at this frequency? Um, this is some n naught, which is the time that I care about. This is the, uh, imagine it's going to be a filter bank. This will be the, the output at that time, n equal to n naught, and j is square root of minus 1. So that's a con uh, complex number, but it's a constant. This is a value which changes with k, so that's, that's, uh, we're going to sum over those values to get the, the filtering effect. Um, and also k is a variable in here. So these are our, this is really what our filter looks like. And this is just, the, the first term is just a phase term. So let's have a look at that. If I took the z transform of it, I would get h, and we've been using tilde to denote the z transform, e to the j, omega. In this case, it's omega naught t. Sorry, I tell a lie. It's not omega naught t. Um, omega t is equal to e to the minus j n naught omega naught t. And then I get g. So that's a constant, so it just stays, nothing's changing. Um, this, now I'm going to take the transform of it and um, I'm going to get the transform of 
g of k. However, from the shifting theorem, this will give me a shift in frequency. So this multiplied by e to the j omega kt well, from a couple of weeks ago, that gives us a shift in frequency. It's actually what we used to uh, prove the Nyquist theorem um, for continuous time way back when. So we'll get um, omega minus omega naught of t. So what is this? This is the Z-transform of G of n shifted to, I guess I should have a plus in there, shouldn't I? No, maybe that's the mistake. That's a minus there, isn't it? Because shifting plus gives you minus here. I can't remember. It's positive? Okay, let's go with positive then. The difference is we just get shifted down to. Wait, so when, oh, the omega minus, omega zero. Oh, that's, yeah, it's minus. Is it minus it's in minus. the notes? Yeah, I thought it would be minus. Sorry, what I'm forgetting here, what I'm forgetting here is the shifting theorem. So is it plus j omega kt gives you minus omega shift in the frequency? I can't remember. Um, so this is a shifted to omega equal to omega naught. So still, this is a bit obtuse. You're probably thinking, what's going on? Let, let's take the magnitude and then draw some pictures. So the magnitude of this filter, the, 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 mag, the, the magnitude response will be the magnitude of this. Remember, it's, it's an exponential e to the j something, so its magnitude is equal to 1. You get e to the j cos of theta plus j sine of theta. And if you take the magnitude, you get cos, square root of cos squared plus sine squared. And cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So the magnitude of e to the j something is always 1. So we just get the magnitude of uh, this, whatever the transform of the window function looks like, um, e to the j. Okay. Yeah. So this now looks like. Th let's anticipate what it's going to be. The window function, g of k, was this kind of bell-shaped window? Maybe it was a Gaussian or a Hamming window. Even if it was a square window, if I took the transform of it, the Fourier transform in the frequency domain, it would be a sink function or some sort of bell-shaped function of frequency. And if it was very, very wide in time, it would be very, very narrow in frequency, and vice versa, very narrow in, in time, very wide in frequency. So this is actually, now that I picked some frequency to evaluate at omega naught, I've now created, um, using these coefficients, I've created a bandpass filter, which is in the frequency domain has the same shape as the window as the time function the, the windowing function but it's been shifted out to be centered at omega naught so it's only filtering frequencies in the region of, of this omega naught value so to draw a picture of that it's as if I take my signal come on I take my signal x of n, which is some signal that I want to evaluate the spectrum of. And then I build these filters. Now, this is not how we do it. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you the, the, the properties of the, the transform. And I might say, well, let's let omega equal to some omega 0, for, which we've been using so far. So maybe that's this value here, omega 0. And what I get is, now, now, maybe I should draw it over here. If I didn't do anything to the window, if I just took its transform, so I didn't multiply, I just took the, the Z transform of, of G of K, and then put in um, z equals e to j omega t to get its spectrum, I would get some kind of sync function centered on zero. But because I've picked a different value of omega, so omega equal to omega zero in the equation, it now gets shifted away from zero. So I end up with this bandpass sort of filter here. And let's call that a filter. And into this goes the signal. And out of it, 
you would imagine we get some fil uh, signal, which is also against time, because that's what a filter will output. And this will be the magnitude of the short time. Well, I would need to estimate the magnitude of the signal, but I'll get the short time for your transform. at over n at some frequency omega naught and it will be in this case here the frequency is quite low so it will only let the low frequency components in the signal through so it might look like um, this or something and then I move on to a different frequency so I say well let's do um, maybe I'll do uh, omega 1 and then I'll get a bandpass filter centered here like this And out of it, I get some signal again. And now this one is, is passing frequencies a little bit higher. Um, so maybe I get the, the next components up from that. And so on. D -d 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 depends on how many you want to do. So this is one way that you could have implemented this. But it's it's the issue here is that um, it's a lot of filters. So we don't do it this way, but what it's allowed us to, to do is to gain some insight into the behavior of the short time for a transform because I can see if this is my, if it's behaving like a filter bank, the width of this window and the shape of this window may be important to me. And this will be something that you have to choose when you do, when you, we're going to use a short time for a transform today. You have to make a decision about, this is defining your, we'll talk more about this later, your frequency resolution. Because you want to, if there were two frequencies close to each other in here, you want to tell them apart. You need that, that lobe to be very narrow. If it's very, very broad, then you're not going to be able to tell those components apart from each other. And the width of this lobe was determined, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all the details later, is determined by the width of the window in time. I'll keep repeating that. If it was a very wide window in time, you get a narrow filter in, in frequency. If it was very narrow in time, a wide filter in frequency. Let's talk about that now. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we don't have too much more to go. So, there's a lot of replication, uh, repetition when we talk about um, random signals, so paraspectral density of random signals. Um, it won't take us too long. And then we can go to the lab. Okay, so, so let's talk about this windowing, windowing issue. Width of this band pass it depends on the width and I should say the shape, well, yeah, it does. It depends on the shape also of the time window, which was G of N, um, lowercase g of N. And the width is N samples, the Q plus 1 samples we had before. Uh, so here's an example that we're familiar with. A rectangular window. Eular window. So I'm not going to do derivation. It's in the notes if you want to have a look. Um, you would have done this for continuous time and had a result which is very similar. It's a sync function. So we get that the transform so remember what this is. This is the Z transform. It's a sequence. So that this G, uh, G of K, this window, bell-shaped window, has some samples in it. And if I took the Z transform of it, I would have the Z transform. And if I want to get its, its spectrum, its, tra its Fourier transform, I would put in Z equals e to the J omega t. That's what we did in the lab the week previous, actually for two weeks previous. And then I take the magnitude of that if I want to see the magnitude of this transform. And the answer that you'll get when you do that is you'll get a sine of n omega t over 
number 2, all divided by sine of omega t over 2. Second, as I look at it, I'm second guessing myself because it's not quite a sync function. But um, uh, you have the notes in front of you there. Is that what's written in the notes for that part? Can you see the transform of the Z transform of a rectangular window? Give me a shout if you can find it. So the next zero of this. is at plus or minus pi. Let's continue assuming this is correct. I, I'm second guessing whether that's a sine or just an omega t over 2. I think it's... Pardon? It's like a but there's no... Is there an equation for this one? Is it sine n omega t over 2? Yeah. Sine omega t yeah, okay. So I think it's correct. So this function's got a funny behavior, but it's limit, in its limit it should go to 1. Um, the next zero of this is going to be when the numerator, so for sine, sine goes to zero for plus or minus pi, and then it will go at plus or minus three pi and so on. So the next zero of this is going to be when this argument is equal to plus or minus pi. And the result that you get for that is um, zero is at plus or minus omega equal to, sorry, omega equal to plus or minus um, 2 pi over t, which is a sampling frequency multiplied by 1 over n. The number of samples. So let's draw a picture, two pictures, four pictures. Here we would have k. Perhaps we have a small, a narrow window in time. So this is my function uh, g of k. where it has only, only a very few samples which are non-zero. Non Maybe it has five. This is my n samples. n equals five. And what would the transform of that look like? This is just a sketch, but We will see it's got some shape that looks like this. I'm drawing the magnitude of it. It would go negative, but um, let's just keep it with the magnitude. We'll go like that and so on. This first one will happen at omega equal to, as I just wrote, um, 1 over n by 2 pi over t, which is the sampling frequency in radians per second over n. And the same for this one. So we can see this, um, if we want to call it frequency resolution, the width of this lobe is 4 pi over t by 1 over n, which is equal to uh, 2 omega s over n, if you want to go down that road. That's in radians per second. If you want to do it in hertz, it's, um, so in hertz, that's this delta f is equal to um, 2 fs over n. And even you could go less. You might say, look, if I want to tell to, um, that's, that's probably a little bit of overkill to say it's that the frequency resolution is, is that big. Yeah, it's going to be smaller by, by a half. So I could do better. If I imagine this, if, I, if that was um, my bandpass, this is the prototype for my bandpass filter, right? I'm going to, after I put it into the crazy equations previous, this shape gets shifted up to some frequency to become a bandpass filter and only frequencies in that range in the range around here get through. So imagine now my signal, I had two 
sinusoidal components and they're very close to each other in frequency and I want to build a filter bank that can separate them from each other. What I want to happen is that this shape gets shifted up to some frequency centered right maybe near to one of the frequencies I care about. So you might have something where um, I get so one of them gets shifted up here like this and I'm hoping that that can let that frequency through and the next one maybe so maybe I've got an F1 here and I've got another F2 here like this and I want to have another one centered close by. The idea is if I wanted to be able to tell them apart from each other I really don't want this window to be so broad that both of those signals can get through the same filter otherwise I can't tell them apart from each other. So imagine a worst case where you know they're very broad even don't even need to draw the second one. Imagine where I had made my time window very uh, narrow and in this frequency domain the bandpass filter its passband is very broad. If I had two frequency components in the signal they would both be able to get in through that filter filter bank and I wouldn't be able to tell them apart. I would just get some output and measure its amplitude and say bingo that's a freq all, all one frequency component. So the time resolution is related to the width of this thing here and you can kind of see that approximately it's equal to half the band because I could maybe just get away with having this one like this and the other one about here, about halfway across it. Uh, I could just tell apart those two signals. So the frequency resolution is probably about half of this. So let's say that should be delta F brand half the width which gives that value there. So let's say that the frequency resolution, two frequencies I could tell apart from each other is approximately half the width of that main lobe because I might have another filter centered where the zero of that, that next um, part of this thing is and I, if I had two components separated by that frequency they could go through different filters and I would be able to tell them apart from each other. Okay, now I'm going to copy this. I, I, I got off track there. I want to copy this and bring it to the next slide. The picture I want to draw on just below it, this is really what the, the illustration is about. put in pictures what I've been saying over and over. Maybe if the window is wider in time, so I've got more samples in there. I'm using a square window because that's what the, the example is about. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. In the frequency domain, what am I going to get? Well, it's now wider in time, so e even from here you can anticipate what it's going to be. The, the first zero, the width of this main lobe, or half the width of it, was the sampling frequency uh, divided by n. And now n is larger, so I'm dividing by a bigger number, so this number is going to get smaller, so the lobe is going to be narrower by that amount. So if I double the number of samples, I half the width of the lobe, so it's going to become narrower. that in English this time. Narrower. And this is wider. So just a note on this. Um, if I call this my delta T and if I call this my delta F approximately, don't take the width of these arrows too literally. I'm just saying we just had a discussion about the frequency resolution is sort of related to the width of this lobe. It's about half the, half the width of the lobe. And similarly, the time resolution is kind of related to the width of the window. 
depends on the shape. Um, you might change the, the, the boundaries of what you would call the time resolution and so on, but you get the point, right? So this could be really wide in time, which means if I put that on top of the signal that I'm analyzing and do the spectrum, I'll get some, prop, some components in the spectrum. I might see a couple of frequency components. I wouldn't know where the, whereabouts in time they're happening. Whereabouts in time is it, it, does the, the signal take that frequency? Um, but I would have very good frequency resolution because the window is wide in time. And vice versa, if I go for a very narrow window in time and I put that, superimpose that on my signal and I chop out the bit of the signal that I care about and I get a result, what I will definitely know is whatever is happening in the result is in this time interval. It's definitely in here somewhere, so I've got very good time resolution. But what will I know about the frequency? Well, I won't know very much about the frequency. Well, I will know something about the frequency, but my knowledge will be a bit looser. I couldn't tell you exactly which frequency component is in there, but I know it's in some wider range. And, and this is surprising to you. The relationship between, so the product of the time certainty and the frequency certainty is constant. So if you put one up, the other one has to go down in order to keep it all equal to k. And this is actually, it's not approximately, this is exactly Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Anybody done quantum mechanics before? You would have done it in physics, yeah. So. If you ever do a course in quantum mechanics, the, the whole idea behind quantum mechanics is that we don't know where any particles are. We can measure them, and then we see where they are. But until that point, their position in the universe is described only by, by what, what is a wave function. And it's literally like for, um, you know, for, for an unconstrained photon, it's a sine wave. A pure sine wave, that could be anywhere in space. As soon as you start to constrain it, say it falls into a Coulomb potential around an atom, and then you get all these, this is where the shells of, a, of an atom come from, the idea. You start to get wave functions there, and they are zero far away, and they have these peaks. So it's all described by waves. So if you ever want to do quantum mechanics, you'd be, do well to do a course in DSP and linear systems first, because it is just full of complex exponentials. It's all waves. Everything is a waveform, just sinusoids and so on. And the idea is that the, when you measure it, the probability of measuring it was described by the amplitude or the square of the amplitude of this waveform. So in this case here, we might have had, I mean, just to, I don't, we're going off topic, but it's interesting. You might have had an unconstrained photon, so that was described by some sinusoid in the background. And I would say to you, what is the energy, the momentum? It's about the relationship in physics is p um, momentum is the equivalent of frequency. and um, time we're using here, this could be position. So um, switch that instead of a waveform in time, which we're using, it could be a waveform in, in location, in space. So this would become, in physics, this would be delta x, and this would be delta p for momentum. The momentum of a particle, I don't know if you've, if you've done this in physics, is related to its frequency. So the higher the frequency of the, par of the particle, the higher its momentum, the higher energy it has. So the point would be, I might ask you a question like, there's a photon out there somewhere, can you tell me where it is? And you would say, no problem, I'm going to do a measurement with some fancy uh, physics equipment, and I will find this photon for you. And you will find it, if you find it here, you'll say, yep, I found it. It's definitely in this range somewhere. And I'll say to you, wonderful, what, what was its energy? And you say, oh, I know that one, because it's an equation that has frequency in it. So you'll say, I'll tell you its energy. And you try to measure the frequency of this waveform. And you tell me, if I show you just this here, what's the frequency of that waveform? Well, you wouldn't be able to tell me very well, because all you can see is this almost a straight line rising. If you want another frequency, you probably want to capture a couple of cycles. So you want to make the, the time window wider. And then you could tell me with more certainty what is the frequency of the waveform, and therefore the energy of the particle. Um, but now what you've lost is the, the spatial resolution. The window is wide in space in x and you don't know where the particle actually was. So the relationship between quantum mechanics, because it's described by waves, probabilities of particles being in places, perfectly described by wave functions, 
Um, this is exactly where Heisenberg arrived at this. I think he just recognized the property that electrical engineers would have stumbled upon a few decades later where they said, yeah, whenever I try and take the spectrum of a signal, I can't figure out when the frequency content was there and what the frequency content was at the same time. So it's not some crazy, it's just simply a property of, of waveforms, right? Not some mystical thing about the universe. What's stranger is why is a particle, the probability of a particle described by a wave? That's, that's the weirdness. Anyway, we digress. Right, move on. So we're about to tie off the short time for your transform some final notes. I know this lecture is a little bit long, but there we go. Um, short time for a transform. Sometimes plotted, or often, I'd say often, maybe not often, sometimes plotted in 2D. So just when you open a textbook and you see a short time Fourier transform and you're expecting to see, you remember Stephen showed you this beautiful three-dimensional artistic drawing which had some contour lines and so on, and you think, where is it? It's in, not in the textbook. All that they will show you is a, a top-down plot where time might run this way and frequency will run that way. And for the example that we had previous, where this was the higher frequency at 2 pi over t1, this is the very first example in the lecture, and this one at 2 pi over t2, um, they will just draw some dark lines. So they might have a, a con like, you could do it as contours, perhaps. But they'll have some shading, and the shading will get less and less as you go away. And then this one will be here. That will be at a heavy line, and the shading will show the width of the, the window function. And you'll have some transition here where this will switch over and so on. So that's just a different way of viewing it. And when we do it in MATLAB, you'll use a function called spectrogram. Spectrogram, I think. And that does it like this, but it uses a heat map. So instead of darkness, I'm just doing like grayscale here. It might have some intense red here for large values and some cool blue color off on the side for, for smaller values. And if you want to, you can grab it, and we will. We'll grab it, and we'll flip it and rotate it around. And you'll see the three-dimensional structure suddenly appear. But if you look top down, you would see it. The same way you look at a map, a contour map of the heights of mountains and so on, you can tell the height of a mountain by looking at the contours and the intensity of the map. But it's actually a three-dimensional terrain. OK. Mm, now, paraspectral density. So I might skim over. I've got a picture here, but I might skip it because it's in the notes. Um, so this is for random signals, stochastic. Um, so they are stationary. We talked about stationary at the start. It just means you can't predict what the signal value is going to be at any point in time, but you know that the, the distribution from which it's being drawn is not changing with time. So if it's coming from a Gaussian distribution, the mean is fixed in time, and the standard deviation is fixed over time that you are, you are assuming. Um, so it's not varying with time. The, the characteristics. Um, and we are interested in, and this is the important part, this is where people get confused, interested in the average frequency content. So the signal is random. We can't just take one part of the signal and say, that's it, I've done a spectrum on this part of the signal, I know the answer. I can tell you everything about the signal. The signal is inherently random, so there's some uncertainty in your knowledge, not, not the same uncertainty about Heisenberg on the previous slide just the property of drawing random samples from a distribution. If you don't take very many, you don't get a lot of information about the distribution. If you take a lot of samples, you should get more information about the distribution. You can estimate the mean better, the standard deviation better. So we expect the exact same behavior or properties here. Um, so this is what's going to be important here. We need to get at this average content. Now, there's a bigger picture. I just want to give you a sense of it. I mean, one idea would be, again, use a filter bank. I mean, if I, if, if I was building an analog system, so some 
resistors, capacitors, and so on, uh, before we had digital computers to do a power spectral density, this is how I would have done it. And you would have had some filter. The signal goes in, um, X of N. And it goes into some filter, perhaps, which has a, you know, maybe a, a, I've got a bunch of filters. It's a filter bank. So here's one, one component in the filter bank where it has a, a, a very narrow pass band around some frequency I care about. And then out of the filter, I get some time domain signal. Um, so signal against time, which does something else. And then I will, I will square it. Well, I shouldn't call it x. Let's call it y, y squared. And then I will average over time. So a time average. And that will give me the result. So I put in x of n into a filter. That's its frequency response description. I will get a signal y of n out y of t, whatever, y. And I want the power in the signal. So the power in the signal is related to its value squared. Um, if you don't understand why that is, come and ask me a question. So I square it, and it makes everything positive as well. That's useful, because I could have a zero mean signal, and if I just average it, I get zero. But the signal is going up and down like crazy. Its average value is zero. What's the power in the signal? So we square it, flips everything positive. Um, and then I take the time average of that. So after I squared this, I might get a signal which looks like it's all positive. It's up here, even more so. Maybe that was like this. Um, and then I take the time average across that, and I say, well, the power in this signal is about here, at that frequency, in this frequency band. And then I'll do another one um, at a different frequency, omega 1, and so on, all the way down. And I'll build up a filter bank. And if, if I only had resistors and capacitors and amplifiers, that's what I would do. Um, but we have digital computers, so we can do it a bit differently. Now, there's an issue here. I've seen people do this in research papers even, um, when they try to estimate the spectrum of a signal, and, it, and it's wrong. Why not use the DFT, for example? Just a Fourier a transform, a Fourier transform. I've got some random signal, and I want to know what is its frequency content. Um, so I just take a, a transform of it, and I get a plot. And I say, well, there it is. The problem with that, I'll draw a picture, but I'll say it in words first, is that the frequency content is changing randomly with time. So if you look at one small region of time, you might say, whoa, there's a one hertz sinusoid in there, it kind of looks like. And then you go a, sec a moment later and you go, oh, that looks like 10 hertz. And then you go, oh, that's 1 hertz. But its phase has shifted now. It looks like it's upside down, perhaps. And then you go a bit later and you go, oh, it's 5 hertz now. What's the frequency content? I can't be sure anymore. Well, you, you'd have to average those over time. And that's what we'll do. It's called the average periodogram. But something mathematically, something unusual happens if you just take a spectrum of the whole waveform, which is that those random changes, particularly the s things which are, are at the same frequency but end up inverting or shifting in phase slightly, the phase shift has the effect of averaging out all of the, the components at that frequency to zero, or at least giving you a large variance around the true value. Um, and that's an issue. So just to give you a diagram to illustrate why that happens, and it's, it's probably the hardest diagram I have to draw in the course because I've got three different sinusoids overlapping. I want to show, let's do some guidelines first. So let's do in blue, we will do, no, in red, in red. Let's do a sinusoid. Um, so the sinusoid starts, let's try and keep this every two squares. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Let's see. One, two, three. Maybe one another one. Finish that one off. Okay. And then let's draw a cosine. The cosine starts at one, so it's always 90 degrees behind, so it's going to hit these values. Um, sorry, this is me helping myself draw a picture. All right, let's draw it. Oh, you bastard. All right. Okay, cosine 
omega t, and the other one was sine. And I'm sure you're wondering why is he drawing this of. This is the basis of a Fourier transform. These are the two functions which make the Fourier transform. So remember, we use an e to the minus j omega t, which is equal to cos of omega t. Cos of minus x is the same as cos of plus x, and it's minus j minus j sine of omega t because, hello, sorry, I know what's wrong, my pan guard is in the, not in the right place, um, sine of minus x is minus sine of x, so we end up with the minus coming out, so you get sine of omega t. So when we do a Fourier transform, it's an integral. We take the function. Remember, it's integral from plus minus infinity, the function multiplied by e to the minus j omega t dt. So really what we're doing is multiplying the function by, by this and then doing a correlation. So we multiply all the parts together and then we sum them up. So if they go the same direction with each other at the same time, we get a big answer. If they go perfectly opposite directions to each other in time, we get a negative but big answer and they do nothing which relates to each other in time, then we get zero, zero correlation. So really, you could do it in two halves. It's all linear. So you can do the cosine part first, and then you can do the sine part, and then you can put it all back together in, in the end, take the magnitude. Now think about, I just want to give you one example of maybe this was a random signal. Um, and these signals do happen. Well, this is exactly how communications of, of uh, phase shift keying works for mobile phones, where they send a sinusoid out for, with a certain phase for a one, um, and when they want to make a zero, they flip it upside down. And that, those changes in phase are very robust. The, the amplitude doesn't really matter. So you can have it be nearer to the transmitter, far away from the transmitter. It's a change in phase which happens. So this is exactly what they do in, in mobile comms. So they have signals like this. Let's go for quite a bold color. So we'll do orange. Maybe this orange lines up with the, let's do it with the sign. So it might follow the sign until around here, perhaps. And then it flips to be the opposite of the sign. And this is my x of t. Now, this is a very contrived example, but I'm trying to prove the point here about why we have to do this average periodogram. If I were to take a Fourier transform of this, and maybe I want to really break it down and show you, show you the, the mechanics of it. I'll do the cosine part first. So I'll say, what is the correlation between this and the cosine component? And for the first part, cosine is 90 degrees out of phase with that. So a correlation between, you can go and do the maths and figure it out, but you'll get zero. So it, up until this point, cosine and sine totally get zero. And then this thing flips upside down. So now I'm doing correlation between, between cosine and minus sine. And it also gets, again, minus zero, which is also zero. It won't quite be exactly zero because we have these windowing effects. I've, I've taken a finite window, so we get some leakage. In, but you get the idea. It's going to be roughly zero. So the cosine component, correlation with this orange signal, almost zero. And the sine component, in this part here, it's perfectly correlated. So I get, up until this point, I get a correlation of plus one. And then it goes negative. So now it's perfectly anti-correlated. So for this part here, I get a correlation of minus one. And when I add them all together, I get zero. So even though this signal, if I said to you, what is the frequency of that orange signal? You'd say, it's about whatever the, f the frequency is there. You, you'll say, well, it looks like there's a cycle. It's about one over that interval. Oh, yeah, and it happens again here. It's, about one, it's definitely about one over that interval, right? And if you do a fo for your, um, transform on it, you get zero. You get that there's no power in that signal. And that's wrong. You know it's wrong. So how do we do it? Well, not unlike the, the short-time Fourier transform. In fact, the calculation is identical for the short-time Fourier transform and power spectral density for the, the, the average periodogram, except for you average over time to get the answer. You, you'll just look at windows. You say, well, what, what's the power in that window? So do a Fourier transform here, and then you move along. You say, well, maybe you move to here. What's the power on this one? Then you move along. What's the power on that one? And then when you finish, you average them all together, and you get an average estimate of what the power spectral density is, and you get much closer to the correct answer. So 
I promise you I've got like two and a little bit pages left, so we won't take too much longer. So here's how you do it. Um, you take your waveform, x of n, and you multiply it by the window function, w of n, I guess w of n minus n0, it doesn't matter. And you, you extracted out the part that you wanted. So very, very much the same as the short time Fourier transform that we just talked about earlier. So we've extracted it. Take the full waveform, find center a window on some region of it. That was G of n previously. And we get this um, little, little extracted section of, this, of the waveform. And let's find out the paraspectral density of it. So the notation gets a little bit odd here because we're talking about powers now. So instead of S, we write SVV. So still it's a Z transform we know from the tilde and we want to evaluate a frequency version of it. So we said Z equal to E to the J omega T. But now we're talking about power. So we have VV. That indicates V squared. It's a power, it's a power spectral density. It's just a notational thing. Um, the way it's done, we're not going to give a derivation here, but it's the discrete Fourier transform, DFT, of that sequence, V of N. The magnitude of that squared all divided by this u term. And this is equal to sorry, my handwriting is too bad. I need to make that look really like a u. And this is an n equals 0 to n minus 1 w squared. It's really got to look like a w. So the problem is we have to be quite particular now about normali normalizing this result because we've taken the waveform and we've multiplied it by a window. And imagine that window had, you know, it might be one in the center, but then it's not one all the way. It falls off. So we've sort of attenuated the power that was in the signal originally. So we re need to rescale the estimate to account for the amplitude of the window at different places. And the way to do it is we sum up the square of the window terms and we divide out by that. And that just normalizes the power. So we get the proper power estimates. If you were to take a sinusoid and put it in, you would see that the, the edges of the window are attenuating the sinusoid. And when you do a, um, a DFT, you won't get the amplitude might be 4. And you would square it. You expect to get 16. And you'll start getting a number that says 14.2. What's going on? But if you do this correction, you'll get, you should get back to 16, for example. So here's the procedure. Number one, you break the signal into, uh, let's call it K. Oh, whoa. Hello. K segments. Number two, Calculate, I should note, note, this is called a periodogram. There are about seven or eight different other, other ways to calculate, estimate power spectral density, and I'm only teaching you one because you can see we've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes and we're still not finished. Um, there are many other ways to do it. This is just one called a periodogram. So take the periodogram. Uh, for each each, which means the steps here are, as I just said, A, you window with W, some window W of N, B, you take a DFT, C, you square it, D, divide by by this U, the window energy. And then the last step is average over K. 
So a picture of it all in progress. X of n looks like this, maybe, and it's some random signal. I don't know what it looks like, but it goes like this, okay? And it's a bit worrying that it's double valued in some places. I break it into k segments, so maybe I have this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, so k equal to 1. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, k is equal to 3 here. And then I window. So I would place a window on each part of this, so one part here, one part here, and one part here. This is my W of n. The result is I get these still random sections of the signal. Um, these are my V's, V of N. So I've taken the original waveform, which is some bunch of, maybe it's random, there's some sinusoids in there, perhaps, maybe not. I want to know what its spectrum is, and I break it into k sections. In this case, it's k equal to 3, and they're not overlapping with each other. And that's something that we will do. We'll even overlap. I'll tell you why shortly. And um, once we've separated out some sections of the signal, we take a Fourier transform, three Fourier transform of each one. We square the value, and that's, how, that's the next step. So we'll end up with some periodograms. So maybe embedded in there, and I couldn't see it for the noise, but there are two frequencies. And for the first one, so this might be S, V, V. Maybe that's called a subscript 1, E to the J, omega T. And then this one being S, V, V, subscript. It goes slower. 2. Um, and this could be S, V, V, subscript 3. This is all against frequency. Maybe here I'll see things which, which all sort of look the same ish, but they're different. Um, so I get some, it never goes zero. Maybe I get something like that and something like that. And then this one I get something that looks like that and something like that. And this one is like that and like that. And you can see each individual one is god awful as an estimate because I only had a very short section of the signal, so maybe the width of this was very wide for starters. Um, but that's more importantly, I don't have a lot of data to, to get the right answer with. So there might have been, um, you know, maybe there was a frequency component in here, a big part of omega 1, but omega 2 wasn't well represented in this section. So it didn't really come out in the transform. Because the signal's random, they, they, those frequency components appear and disappear and change, they invert, they go upside down. But on average, they're present or not. Then over here, something else happened where maybe in this section of the signal, omega 1 wasn't well represented. It just wasn't there, but omega 2 was. And then later in time, we see something, you know, it goes back the other way. This just, I'm just making this up, but you get the idea that it's random. So sometimes the component is there and sometimes it isn't. And if I look at it over a lot of time, a lot of time seg segments, I should see on average whether it is or isn't present in the signal. So that's the last step, which is to average over time. So you put them all together and you get some final estimate which is called the averaged periodogram. Also called Welch's, Welch, <coughs> Welch with a C, Welch's periodogram. And in MATLAB it's called, the function is P Welch. And it will be just be a better estimate. So you'll have something that will be a bit more like that. It's my SVV. All right. Mindful that uh, we're going a little bit over time now. I've got just two more things to say. One is about the choice of K. I'm not going to prove to you here, but we can. It can be shown that the variance. This is statistics.
So if I didn't do this average periodogram, this is, this is the result for the average periodogram. If I didn't do that, I would get some other estimate. So maybe I, maybe I just went for, um, for x of t. So I, took, I, look, I do my, you know, I, oh, sorry, e to j omega t like this. I just take a transform of it, absolute value, whatever, right? Um, and I normalize out by the window thing and so on. If I was naive and I just went for that as my estimate, with no averaging over time, what would I get here? Well, it turns out that making the, this is taking all of the data. It turns out that the answer that you get for the variance is actually more or less equal to the value itself. Um, do I have to write the whole thing again? I guess so. Over you. So what I mean is, here's my, maybe if I average for a long time and I, I find the true spectrum, it looks like this. What this means is, at any frequency that I choose, the variance in this estimate, this is only, only my estimate, I don't really know the answer, but perhaps this is the true answer. My variance will be proportional to that value, which means um, my confidence interval, if you want to call it, would be here, it's small, but then it gets large. So the answer could be anywhere from here to there and so on, same with this one. And that's a terrible estimator. So you get an answer. The true answer should be here. But you might get an answer here, or an answer here, or an answer anywhere in this range with a Gaussian distribution. Um, and you don't know the truth. And the reason is because it's a random variable. And it, it, it doesn't matter how long the signal goes. Because of those inversions that I talked about, you can either get zero, or they can add constructively together. And you can get double the answer, actually, than what you thought you were going to get. So the variance is really terrible if you just go down the naive approach where you use all of the data in one transform. So the better way is you get this one. So you end up with, um, let's call that um, SXX. And if I did it this way, I would get SXX divided by K. And that's better. So this, this is just straight from statistics. If I have a random variable and now I'm averaging across k different values of it, um, then the variance goes down by 1 over k. So I might tell you, I want to know, I want you to build me, this is a, a, a typical exam question, I want you, you to build me a, a spectrum analyzer that can, can achieve a variance which is within 10% of the true value um, of the, the spectrum. How would you do it? What value of, of k would you choose? So you can, it's pretty straightforward. You can see from that that you've got to choose k so that the variance is 10% of the actual value. Okay. So final notes. I think draw the pictures first. Um, We haven't really had a chance to talk about this, although hopefully you got a chance to observe some of this when you did the filters lab last week or the week before. We've talked a bit about this before in the past. Um, w1 of t. If I have a time window, so this is about the shape of the window. We've already talked about the, the width of the window having an effect on resolution, frequency resolution. The shape also has some uh, effect. So we saw before the rectangular window is pretty poorly behaved in frequency. It has, well, it has the narrowest of all the lobes. So you do get a narrow main lobe, but you get a lot of side lobes. Um, and this is frequency. If I took a, what's called a tapered or a bell-shaped window, like a Hanning or Han, then we get a shape that's more like this. This is W1 J omega. The effect that you get is you don't get much of those. You get a wider main lobe, and you don't really get many ripples on the side. So you get 
So this is smooth. And this is less um, ripples, which means less smearing or leakage. But this means poor frequency resolution. So we have another effect. This is a different effect on frequency resolution. Before it was the width of the window, so forget about this window. I was saying a narrow window means broad in frequency, that's poor resolution, and that makes sense because I've got a narrow time window. I can't really see what the signal is doing. Um, I need a wide window to see what the frequency content of the signal is. So narrow in time is broad in frequency, and that's bad for frequency resolution, great for time resolution. Broad in time means narrow in frequency, and that's wonderful for frequency resolution, but it's very awful for time resolution, and that's the Heisenberg trade-off. Now we have another effect, which just confuses people sometimes. We have the shape of the window causing an effect on frequency resolution. Because the window is smoother, it is spread over, its main lobe is spread over a wider number of frequencies. So we've made the window broader in frequency just by, by tapering or making the window nice and smooth. And the reason we did that is if it was very limited in time, we get this sharp transition in time which leads to a lot of side lobes. And you'll see today in the lab, we'll try a few different windowing types, and you'll see this is hideous. You'll have huge, in when represented in depth decibels, you'll have incredible leakage all the way from a pure sign or frequency that the bat is generating. You'll have this uh, leakage across nearly the entire spectrum, but the main lobe will be really, really narrow. So you can't have it all. If you, if you want to know two different frequencies apart, uh, separated from each other, this is probably the window to use. But you will have no real idea what's hap what the values are because the leakage is so bad between them. Whereas if you don't really care about the frequency resolution, you just want to get the answer, the, the, the values correct, um, this is probably a good one. It's got a fatter low but very little leakage on the side. So I understand you, you don't have the experience, the hands-on experience to know what I mean. When you play with these windows today in the lab, this will you'll get it definitely. It's, very, it's actually quite striking the effect that these windows can have. Um, okay, oh, last thing, very last thing. And I, I guess I kind of mentioned it. Where should we put, put these windows? Um, X of N. So we were putting windows separated like this where I have my signal and I have one window here, one window here. These are what's called non-overlapping. You can see that this sample here in time, for example, it never gets used. It gets a weight of zero for, for the end of one window and a weight of zero for the next. So it seems foolish to do that where we almost don't use half of the samples in the signal. So a way to remedy that is we, we have a 50% overlap. So I shift the window along by 50%. Um, so if the window is that wide, the shift from here to here is n over 2. So 50% overlap. And that's almost traditional to do that when you do spectral analysis to try and make the best use. Uh, we don't use rectangular windows, usually we use a tapered window and because of that we end up not using samples on the, on the tail ends of the tapered window so we overlap by 50% to give them a chance to contribute to the result. Okay, does anybody have any questions? You can always ask me in the lab, we're going to see each other in there very shortly. So, Good, okay, let's do it. <laughs>